I think you can you can um, turn on your cameras and and um, your session is gonna start at eight a.m. So like five more uh, ten more minutes. Hello, um, can, can you say something? Um, not yet. Um, could, could, could you s uh, choose the right microphone? Not, not yet. Um, if not, you, you, you just can... You can close uh, the classroom and re-enter again to see whether the microphone is working. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Now can, can you hear me? Now. Yep. Nice. <laughs> yes. Bye. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll just turn off the light so the audience can. If you can hear me, put your hands up. Okay, now I'm happy. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, your session, you're going to start. I just have no people in 10 minutes. I can't hear you, Harry, by the way. Let me just check why. Oh, I know why. Okay, Harry, can you talk? Hello? Yep. Yes, great. Okay, I'll see you all in uh, six minutes. Yeah, sure, sure. Because at, at the moment, um, the audience is, is uh, the offline audience is joining the session with us. So uh, we can wait until eight, and then we can start. Um, today there okay. are two channels: the offline classrooms, um, and on also we have the online classroom as well. Good job. Yeah, people like people online. People also is chatting is online chat now. So uh, on online, there's probably like two hundred participants is watching online. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, two hundred. Good to meet you all, if you can hear and see me. Okay. Let me check the volume. Am I loud enough for everybody? That's good. Okay. Just coming in. <laughs> Wonderful. Everybody's sitting at the back. No one wants to sit in the front.
um, hey Chase, I, I, I'm just testing the audio qualities at the physical classroom a bit. Could you like count one, two, three, four, five, so I can see where? Yep. Test one, two, three, four, five. Test seven, six, three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Four, three, six, seven. All right. Right. It's, it's, it's okay now. Great. It's really cool to see everybody in the room and that I'm in Shanghai and you guys are in Na Trung. Very cool, Harry. Just uh, turn out the lights so everyone can see you better. I think we, we can start now. Yeah, we can, we can start now. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. I'm going to show you my presentation in a minute, but just so you know, I'm coming to you from Shanghai today. If you can hear me clearly, can you put your hands up just so I can tell? Everyone in the room can hear me. Great. And if you're online and you can hear, you can type a message that just says yes or something like that. So, all right. So, good morning to everybody. Um, this session is called Creating Future Classrooms Today. And my name is Jake Whitten. And I am the head of learning at StudyCat. I've been in Asia for the last 17 years teaching and training, and I've been lucky enough to train in many, many countries like Japan, China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore. So hopefully I can bring you some experience today. Um, I used to be, I used to work at Macmillan Education. So if there's anyone from Macmillan in the room, Good to see you. I'm not sure if anyone's there from Macmillan, but hopefully. And today I'm presenting in collaboration with Classin. StudyCat and Classin have done a lot of collaboration over the last few years. And I think the reason is because we both believe the same thing. We just want to be able to create better learning opportunities for students all around the world and using technology. So StudyCat make language learning apps for kids. Classing is, a, is an online platform, but essentially we believe in the same thing. So I'm going to start with two quick stories. Um, the first story is when I was uh, back in 2010, I used to work in a big language learning, uh, a big language learning institution. And they decided that they wanted to bring in interactive whiteboards into every classroom and they spent millions of dollars on it. So all these classrooms got interactive whiteboards. The problem was that nobody knew how to use them. The software wasn't very good. And in the end, they just got used for writing words on them. So they just became kind of like glorified whiteboards and they were never really used properly. The next thing that the school did is they bought 20 iPads for every school. And the problem was the software wasn't very good. No one really knew what to do with them very well. And, the, and you also had to lock them away in a cupboard and we weren't allowed to get them out. So we never ended up using the, the technology. So a lot of the teachers, um, I was a DOS, a director of studies at the time, and they would say things to me like, I don't need this. I'm already a great teacher. Technology can't replace me. Um, and this is something for the future. And I used to think that too. I used to think technology was just something to use in the future and it's no good to use it and you can't replace me as a teacher. So that was 12 years ago. But let's fast forward to one more story. 
In 2018, I used to have my own school and I had about 200 students in my school. And one day, I walked into my class a lot earlier than I used to walk in. And this is what I saw in the classroom. I saw kids at their desks and they were using phones and iPads and tablets and they were all learning something. One, one group of kids was doing a song in English, some other kids were doing some math, another kid was doing some reading homework. And it was on that day that I realized that the future that I was really worried about and didn't think was going to come was already happening. And it wasn't happening in class time and it was being led by parents and students. Parents and students were already using educational technology in their classrooms, so in their homes and before class, but in my class, I wasn't using any. So it was really at that point that I realized, how can I have much better effort at bringing technology into my classroom? Because everything had changed and they were already doing it. So I said the title of my talk was creating future classrooms today. But then over the last week, I realized, well, it's not the future anymore. So I'm going to get rid of the word future. And then I thought it's going to be called creating classrooms today. But that doesn't seem very interesting. So what I realized, I'm going to change the word classrooms to the word learning. Because even all my students were already learning using technology outside the classroom. So then I thought, I'll call my talk Creating Learning Today, but it wasn't, didn't really encompass what I want to say today. So then I said, Creating Quality Learning, Outcomes and Opportunities Today. Okay, that's pretty good, but then it doesn't talk about technology. So then I will call my talk Creating Quality Learning, Outcomes and Opportunities Today, Using Educational Technology, that is very easy to adopt. So that's my new title. It's a little bit long, but this is the title of my talk today, creating quality learning outcomes and opportunities using technology that is easy to adopt. So I'm gonna ask you a question in a minute, so get ready. Um, when I've been a trainer, I've traveled to many schools around Asia, and in COVID time, I spoke to so many schools. And I found that there are three types of schools. There's, a, there's this school that has all the technology and all the fancy hardware, but they don't use it effectively. They don't train teachers how to use it, or they're not getting the right software, and they, they look fancy, and all the parents like it, but they're not really focusing on the learning. And then there's another type of school that have no technology, and they don't even want technology. They are still like I was 10 years ago. They're saying, I don't need the technology. I don't want the technology. You can't replace me. Um, or some teachers are saying, it's too difficult. Oh, I want to get this, but it's too hard to bring it in. And then finally, we have uh, type number three, which have already integrated technology and enhanced learning outcomes already. So who thinks they are, hands up if you are part of number one? No one? Okay, what if you are a school like number two? <laughs> what if you're a school like number three? I don't think anyone can hear me. Okay, so. Hi, hi Jack. Um, yeah, ju just yeah. a little feedback. Uh, I, I just sent you a message. So uh, would you can just make the, the microphone? Oh from your side a little bit smaller. So, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so everything... um, give me one second. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. It's in the settings, right? Oh, so what about now? Is this better? This loud? Uh, this loud? Smaller, smaller. This loud. loud? Yeah. This loud? Yeah, I think just right. Is just this right. better? Yeah, just right, just right. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, I've turned it down now. So these are the three types of schools, and I'll try to talk a little bit quieter for you. Po apologies for that. Um, and I, I think that I still see a lot of number one and two schools, but hopefully by the end of this, we can talk about how we can have schools like number three, where we've got successfully integrated technology for learning outcomes. So the overview of my talk today is 
I want to talk about the science of learning because if we don't really understand what learning is, how can we know if we're getting the right technology? And I want to say that learning is not just about curriculums, learning is about how we learn. And, and I think education technology has allowed us to really enhance our learning. And then I want to define what I mean by educational technology and how it's changed today. And lastly, we're going to talk about how we combine these to have better learning outcomes. So when adopting new technology, what should we be thinking about? If you see Harry, Harry, can you just ask anyone in the audience if we have new ed tech, what should we be thinking about? Can you just ask one person? So, um, or you don't have the microphone? Right, Do you have a microphone for the audience? Yeah. Anyone <laughs> would like to uh, share a bit when- Just one person. Yeah, when not to the new ed tech, what should we thinking about? Like, Anyone would like to share your opinion about that question? Don't be shy. Just ask anyone, Harry. Thank you. Anyone would like to share a bit about like adopting a new asset, what we need to consider? I, I think, uh, uh, first, I would like to know if my devices or my equipment can can run the the, the, the new tech. So, uh, yeah, very good. You say the first one is about the devices. Whether I have good enough devices to run the software. Okay. Yeah. Okay. W one more. One more. Thank you, Harry. I, I think the the question is also apply in tech, and although I just came in, but I think. Uh, for me, when uh, applying the new uh, technology or platform for teaching, uh, besides uh, what uh, Mr. Zhuang said, I think we also need to um, think about training the teachers and staff and also students so well <laughs> so that they know how to use the maneuver the technology effectively. Um, yeah, and also uh, think about the equipment, whether your equipment are available and accessible and uh, whether they are um, compatible with the technology device that you would like to introduce for teaching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is exactly the type. Very good, Harry. Oh, let's move on now because we've got a lot to go through. So I think that's the type of thing I always hear. Is the equipment going to be good enough? Okay. Or a lot of people say, oh, sorry, uh, Harry? Can I just put in a word? Thank you very much. That's a good question. And what I'm thinking about is, Something that is user friendly, not too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. I, we don't have to do a lot of clicks before we can run a program. So user friendly, easy to use, and that is what I'm thinking about. Thank you. Perfect. So these are the exact things that people always talk about, right? Things like does the hardware work? Can I get training? Is it easy to use? But I think the number one question is this. Before you even think about those things, we should be asking this question. Will this technology lead to better learning outcomes and opportunities? Will this technology lead to better learning opportunities and outcome? And I think we forget about this question a lot. We always jump straight to the training and the hardware when we got to think, does this technology even have good learning? So to understand that, we've got to talk about learning, okay? So what is learning? And let's go. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to show you four pillars of the science of learning, and a lot of what I'm talking about comes from these four uh, people. If you have a camera, take a photo now. If you have any chance to read these guys, Dr. Stanley Dehan from the Cognitive Psychology in Paris, Kathy hirsch Pasek, really focusing on young learners and technology. Huberman talks about how the brain works with technology, and Patricia Cool is the same, about how we develop minds in a digital age. All of these guys will really talk about how learning works, but let's go. So there are four pillars that I want to talk about. There are four pillars up here on the board, and I've left out a letter for each one. What I want you to do is just spend 20 seconds with the timer on and talk to your friends what do you think these words are? What is this first one here? Is it focusing, attend, 
So I'm going to give you 20 seconds, okay? Ready, go. Try to guess what they are. Talk to your friend. Five, four, three, two, one. Don't. Okay. So I, I won't go through the answers with you. I'm just going to tell you the answers now. So the first one is focusing attention. And I'm going to explain these again in a minute. The second one is active engagement. The third one is increasing challenge. And the last one is continuous feedback. These four pillars are really what all of these neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, and learning experts talk about. Attention, engagement, challenge, and feedback. And this is what we should be thinking about if we're thinking about technology. Think about these things first. There's one more, and I'll tell you that one at the end. So I'm going to go quite quickly now, okay, just so you can get an overview. For focusing attention, we mean that we are ensuring that learners focus on relevant information that they reduce the distractions and keep the learners on task. And I want to show you how technology does that better than anything that even we can do as teachers. Um, Daham says, selecting relevant information is fundamental to learning. In the absence of attention, discovering a pattern in a pile of data is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So we want to help kids focus on their learning. Number two, Active engagement. Active engagement is about ensuring that learners are maximizing interactions with the learning content. That it doesn't mean sitting here staring at a video. It means that they've got to be interacting with the learning content because that's how the brain works. Kathy hirsch Pasek says active engagement takes place in our minds, not in our feet. And she calls this minds on learning. If you're just staring at the teacher you're, and you're not interacting, you're probably not learning much. The guiding principle could not be clearer. A passive organism does not learn. Active engagement needs to be promoted. And I want to show you how technology does that, like we are today, we're interacting. Number three, increasing challenge. We call this, you know, keeping learners in the zone of proximal de development. I don't, don't know why that happened. Or the very famous um, language researcher Stephen Krashen talks about input plus one. It's about making sure students are always being challenged a little bit above their level. And that's what technology can do really well. And we'll show you some examples. It's making learning conditions reasonably more difficult will paradoxically lead to increased engagement and cognitive effort. And then it also improves attention. Um, a lot of our research at StudyCat shows if we keep kids at about eight, about 80%, they're getting 80% correct, they are much more likely to want to keep on playing our apps. If we go to 100%, they stop playing because it's too easy. If we go to, if we make it too hard, they stop playing because it's too difficult. The last one is continuous feedback. You constantly need feedback if you are learning. And in the ESL industry, we have a big argument over error feedback. Should we be giving lots of feedback on errors and when to do it? A lot of people say, no, 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 wait till the end of class. Or maybe like my daughter does some homework and then she has to wait three days to get her feedback. What technology does, it allows us to have it allows us to keep learners informed as well, sorry, informed on how well they're learning, and we reduce that delay to feedback, and this develops independent learners. I will show you some um, uh, examples of this. Everyone should learn to happily make errors. To think is to move from one error to the next. We, What technology allows us to do is let kids really let making mistakes become part of their learning. And we should let them make mistakes because that means that they are being challenged and that they are learning. So that's the four things, focusing, active engagement, increasing and continuous feedback. That's all I want to talk about today. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about, the four pillars of learning. Um, attention, engagement, challenge and feedback. Try to remember them. 
There's one more, and we'll get to it at the end. So start to think what might be the fifth thing. Now I want to talk to you about, uh, sorry. Whoa, 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 sorry. Now I want to talk to you about technology. And really quickly, can you just ask this one question to the room? What has changed about technology, education technology in recent years? Harry, just ask one person. What has changed about it? Sure, sure. So um, anyone would like to address the question, like what has changed about education technology in recent years? Uh, recently, we see a lot of changes. So what, what can you share a bit about it? Just one, yeah, just one person, because I'm running behind now. Anyone? I think uh, I, I witnessed the uh, the rapid development of mobile technology. So I think education now can uh, can happen anywhere, anytime. With good I love advice. it. What's your name? My name is Jun. What's his name? My name is Jun. Oh, I can never say, Bjorn, well, thank you very much. That was really good. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history of educational technology, but this will highlight the biggest change that we've had. And I'm going to do this a little bit quickly because I want to really get in to show you some examples. So did you know that this black, this is a, called a green slate chalkboard. It was invented in the 1840s but we didn't take it into schools until the 1930s. It took 90 years to get this technology into the classroom. The whiteboard was invented in the 1960s, but it wasn't put into classrooms until the 1980s and 1990s. The reason why was because no one had invented the erasable whiteboard marker until 1975. So it took a long time for, the, for these things to be adopted. The same with the interactive whiteboard, invented in the 90s, but it took a 10 years for it to get into classrooms. So as you can see, it's starting to speed up. I'll just show you a few more examples. Television, invented in 1920s, it took 30 years to get into the classroom because they were so big and inconvenient. You know, you had to really bring them into the classroom. Projectors were invented in the 1920s, but we didn't really see them in the classrooms until the 1990s. And I'll forget about VHS. The tape recorder was invented in 1909. The first time we saw um, tape recorders in classrooms was in 1950s, but they were really big and you had to carry them in. But then there was a big revolution because they invented the cassette tape. And this was the first time that we saw technology shrinking down and you could now take this into the classroom very easily. And so qu quite quickly they were adopted because it was convenient. You could stop, start, rewind. And then we replaced the cassette tape with one thing. We replaced it with CD players. And these were invented in 1982, but came into the classroom in the 80s and 90s. And just that, that change of changing to a CD player meant that you could stop, rewind, go back and find all those listening activities. So you can see as, as the technology gets smaller and more convenient, the faster people want to use it in classrooms. One more, this was the very first programmable computer that was called Colossus. It never made it into schools because it was too big. But then we invented the personal computer and very quickly, so many classrooms now have a computer because they have so much more that they can do. All those other things can be done in one place. But then we had the single biggest technological change in a very long time. And I think you all know what it is, right? The smartphone and the, and the, ta the tablet invented in 2008 and 2010, and they were adopted into schools almost straight away. The reason that they were taken into schools is because every one has one in their pocket. I'm sure all of you have a phone in your pocket now. It's easy to integrate these into classrooms. And any new software is only one download away. So if I want to get class in, it's one download on my phone or one button, and I can use it straight away. All of my students can as well. 
And how many of your students now have access to a smartphone? You don't have to answer, but I'm sure it's, a, even if it's just their parents' phone, kids now have access to this, which means when we had COVID lockdown, we could all instantly access all of this. The Vietnamese government says the proportion of adults using smartphones in Vietnam is 73.5%. Vietnam aims to increase this rate to 85% by the end of 2022. This is according to the National Digital Infrastructure Strategy, meaning your government is really supporting the idea of everybody having access to phones, which means that we can be integrating these more and more into our classrooms. So just to summarize that part on actual education, we've gone from really high cost things to low cost, We've gone from really inconvenient, you know, big tape recorders or big TVs to super convenient. And more importantly, as uh, our friend said, we've gone from hardware to software. Now you only need this or you only need a tablet. You don't need all that extra stuff because it's all available. What a lot of teachers today do is they tell the kids, you can't bring your phone to the classroom. You must turn it off. What I want to convince you is that they already have the technology, so let's try and help them use it. So we're just going to talk about this. So this, because we have now have this, we have the phone, as our friend said there, we see an explosion of new opportunities for learning. And we see so many things coming out now. We see lots of curriculum-based apps like Khan Academy and Raz Kids and IXL, ABC Mouse. We have Fun English, which is from StudyCat. We see lots of sandbox apps. These are the types of software where kids just play, but they're learning, but they don't have a curriculum. And excitingly, we see lots of platforms coming out like Class Dojo or Google Classroom or Quizlet or ClassIn which allow you to use all this software to make learning better. So I'm really excited because the last five years has been so exciting with how much more stuff we can use for learning. So let's have a look at this. And I don't like to call it education technology. I think we should call this learning technology. It's not about education. It's about are they learning? So I want to show you some examples from StudyCat and I want to show you some examples from class in and then I want to answer some questions at the end. So um, have a look at this here on the screen. You can see a game from our fun French program, right? What do you think this, Harry, what do you think the language focus in this game is? Harry? You want me to ask the audience, right? No, I just, you can answer for me. What do you think is the language focus? I think it's, it's the communication skill. I mean, the, the, the learners can apply the language. Yeah, but what, what in this game you can see on the screen, what is the topic, do you think? Very simple topic. Uh, I can see a uh, balloon, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good job. Someone online just said it. Hang Nga just said colors. Very good in the live chat. I say the live chat is beating the room now. So good job. Let me show you an example of how this works, and then we can um, quickly assess that. I'm going to do this quite quickly now, okay? So color bubbles. We're all going to learn some French very quickly, okay? okay. Are you ready? Fun French by Study Cat. <laughs> I just thought I'd show you some French because we all speak English. Jaune, jaune, bleu, bleu, rouge, rouge. So we've done yellow, blue, red, jaune. Okay, now you see that it starts to give you two. So we're increasing the challenge. Il est bleu. Rouge. Bleu. And I'll just show you for another 30 Jaune. seconds. Okay. And then you see it gets even harder. We start to put three in. 
Now, we don't have to teach the kids anything. They just have to play. And they know if they get it wrong, it gives them instant feedback. So they know what they are getting wrong and they know what they are getting right. So just that example shows you very, very, very simply how color, a simple colors game, a simple game like that, focus their attention on learning. It increases in challenge and it gives them instant feedback, yes or no. And if they did this before class, by the time they come to class, they've already started to learn some of these French words, if they're doing French, for example. Let me show you another example. What is the language focus on this one? The language focus on this textbook is big or small, and it's focusing on adjectives of size. And all the student has to do is circle each of these, and it might take them about 10 seconds to finish. But what I want to show you is how if you integrate technology, you can make something like learning the size of something much more interactive and much more engaging. So let me just show you a quick video. I hope these videos are working. And I'll press play. A big motorbike. A small so motorbike. Tap. A small boat. A small boat. Oh. A big boat. A big boat. A big motorbike. So a as you see boat. here, a big boat. A small I'll speed it up for you. Car. So as you see, in a simple activity like this, in a textbook, all you can do is circle. In this, you're seeing big, small, big, small. You've got to listen to big and small. Then you've got to tap the correct answer. It tells you if you're wrong or right. And then it keeps getting more and more difficult. It's much more aligned to learning than a textbook, for example. I'm not bad mouthing textbooks. I'm just saying just to show you that example. So as you can see, it's more active engagement because they have to interact with the learning material. They are focusing their attention because they've really got to look what is happening there and they're increasing in challenge. I'll just show you one more. This one is Spanish. I don't know if anyone speaks Spanish, but what do you think the language focus is, Harry? You can ask someone, what is the language focus? What topic are we learning? Or the people in the live chat, what topic are we learning here? When I look at this one, I can think that uh, we are focused on the numbers. I'm going to learn about the numbers. Yeah, numbers and and maybe animals. Something. Like yeah, that. very good. So just to teach numbers and animals, we can have something very simple like this game. I'm going to do it in Spanish for you. So you um, and then just to give you an example of how it works. And then I will speed up to some other things. Un gato. So you see here, it starts that's super Un simple. Pájaro. Un pájaro. I don't know. Un gato. Un gato. Oh, maybe it's cat. Un pájaro. Un pájaro. Dos. See, the good thing here is we start easy. We focus their attention. If they get the answer wrong, it's okay. We just they just they just see a red thing and it says you got it wrong. That's okay because they start to learn on their own. You don't even need the teacher there to oh, input cool. this language. Okay. Then it starts to get more difficult. Tres ratones. Tres ratones. <laughs> Un pájaro. Un pájaro. So you have to think, is it this one or is it this one? But what they start to do is really, um, they start to pick up the language without you having to explicitly teach it. And then by the end, we get it all the way up to tres conejos. So it might be rabbits, one, two, three. And you watch the kids, they will do this on their own, and then they start to learn those words. The point I'm trying to make here is that by just doing this type of activity, we're focusing attention, we're increasing in challenge, and we're giving feedback. And these are the keys to learning. Right, I had some more examples from study cap, but I want to get to class in because I think class in, we have to show class in as well. So I want to show you something from class in and how using class in really highlights how all these pillars of the science of learning. So forget about the curriculum, forget about the hardware, just think about does this technology help learning? 
Now, this is a, a famous picture from Class In. This comes from their website. But what is happening in this picture? So if you just look in this picture, it just looks like a bunch of kids on computers looking at the teacher. But there is much more happening in this picture. So firstly, there's a question here on the board. So the teacher can pre-prepare the questions on the board and the kids are focused in on that question. And they can see the same question on their laptops. Now, some kids have laptops, some kids have tablets. You could even do this on your phone. Then, then they have to press a button and answer the question. And then all those question answers come up here on the board. So what is happening is there's a real active engagement. The question to the students, back to the board. The kids can see, OK, what, what did everybody else answer? Did I answer what the other kids answered? And then the teacher can see, OK, half my kids know what is happening. So by doing this, it's active engagement because it's interactive. It lets the kids focus their attention in because they have their own device on their on their desk. They can actually see what they're going to be learning rather than having to just stare at the board. They the teacher gets feedback because the teacher can see how well they're answering. You know, if all the kids get the wrong answer, then I can then I can go back and teach it again. Or if I can see the opinions of my class. Oh, sorry. And lastly, oh. Oh, that's it. Um, and then in this example of class scene, it just shows you that they have so many things available to you. Things like uh, all the stuff here in the toolbox, which lets you have things like timers and stopwatches and dices. And I'll just show you one more example of that, because then you're actually interacting in the class rather than just presenting at the front of the class. And as again, this is the respondents box as well. I want to show you some examples of me teaching using class in. Um, I won't show you the video, but just some of the highlights of why I think using class in really highlights the science of learning. So firstly, it's you can move your students around. So maybe when I want the students to focus on me, I will make myself big on the screen. I want to I want you all to focus in on me now. And this means you need to be listening to the teacher. Um, but then you can go on and then you can bring all your students down. So they it means that the teacher now is not the most important person. It means that I'm down in the corner and these kids can interact with each other. You could have a live class with kids in one place and the kids in a room. And what you get is this nice grid of kids on the on their screen, which means that you're really focusing attention on all these different kids in the room. Um, this is another thing that they do is they have these great things called EDBs and you can create little classes really quickly. So in this one, I can bring a student down to here, as you can see um, on the screen, and now it's their turn to do something. So they have to move this to match the fruits. The point is that I can now move them around and now we know, OK, at this point, this student is the one that we need to focus on and we're all going to listen to this student and you can see all the kids are watching that student right um here's another example where you can play a game you can set up your classroom and in this one it's about fruits and then they and i can put the kids into different teams and then we roll the dice and it makes it a lot more of an interactive experience in fact i think we should play this game really really quickly just for a bit of fun. I hope I have the right one here. Fruits dice game. OK, I'm going to take your blackboard away. Can you add the blackboard back later, Harry? Can I say again? Can I say again? Harry, thank you. Great. Huh? It didn't work. Oh, I can't override it. One second. Fruits dice game. Do you want to clear the comment? Oh, it won't let me write, override it. Oh, well, that's OK. I um I can't actually do it now, Harry. Sorry. I was going to play a little that's game with with your. That, that's okay. But basically, it's very simple, right? It takes no time to learn to do this. Very simple. Roll the dice in your class. It says six. Then the kids just have to yell out bananas. Roll again. Five. Oh, grapes. Pineapples. Yeah, very simple, right? I mean, it's such a simple thing to do, but it makes the kids realize they're focusing their attention on the dice. Then they have to 
say, okay, five is the grapes, and then they've got to go through a cognitive process, and then they've got to say grapes. That's much, much more focused on learning than just a teacher saying grapes at the front of the classroom. So I just wanted to show you how much more interactive it can be. Okay, moving on. And it really encourages that. I want to talk about the last bit, which is about feedback. Um, what I love about Class In and StudyCat is that because we have technology and technology is collecting data, we can start to see data insights on how the kids are learning, not just what they're learning, but how they're learning. So if we have this student here, we can see her duration on stage. Let's have a look. Okay, she spent 10 minutes on stage talking so far. So maybe I want to increase, but we can see how long has she been speaking for? 36 minutes speaking. It means I can get individual data on each student and find out really, are they learning in the classroom? So the feedback is going to the kids, but it's also coming back to you as a teacher. And the same here, you can see, you know, how many times have I used this courseware? What was my average um, length of using material? How many uh, rewards did I give out? So suddenly we get all this feedback on how well kids are learning in your class. And the point is, it means you understand not just what they're learning, but how they are learning. I'll just show you that in StudyCat. With StudyCat, we have every word that they tap, we can start to see how well they did. So if they're getting green, that means they're doing really well, they're always getting it right. If they're getting red, it means they're always getting it wrong. So then the kids and the teachers can see this. They can say, oh, okay, I need to do better with rabbit. So try to remember to focus on rabbit. There's no way you can do that in a classroom of 25 kids and try to remember what every kid is learning. But because we have technology, we can now see how every kid is learning. We can also see things like how many minutes did they play for? How many activities did they play? And we can start to see, are they making an effort? Are they progressing through the course? So I think one of the great things about technology today is that it allows us to see exactly what kids are learning. Okay, so that was all about learning technology, but I have one question for the end. Attention, active engagement, challenge and feedback. And remember I said there is one more thing. So Harry, what is the missing link in all of this technology? What is the missing link? Can you ask someone in the room? Okay. Yeah, yeah, what is the missing pillar? Yeah, we, we have four, four things uh, he mentioned already. Attention, active engagement, challenge, and feedback. So what is missing here? And one more, what do you think? What's, what are the missing pieces in learning technology? Just share your idea, just share your voice. What do you think is one mission thing in the learning technology? Anyone? Anyone, just, just share anything. Don't, don't worry, don't worry to make me tech. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be shy in the morning, Harry. Yeah. Anyone, Anyone on the live chat? Go share. Anyone in the live chat want to share? Um, what's a missing one? I heard someone say something. Yeah, I think it's about the outcomes. One, uh, one person say it could be the outcome. About outcomes. Okay, I'm more talking about the things that work in our mind to help learning happen. Tell you all, okay. So the missing link here, all of the research is on learning. They talk about these four things, but they always say there's one more pillar, one more thing kids need to learn. And that is, and that is, and sorry, and that is social interaction. Kids need to interact with each other to learn. And this was re oh, sorry, guys. This was mm, sorry, this was really highlighted during the COVID school closures. So many kids were stuck at home and they weren't interacting with each other. And we know that so much learning comes from interacting with other learners. When in, and even as adults, right? You need to interact to learn. It wakes up the neurons, it helps you focus your attention. Sorry, do you want to extend the class? Uh, uh, yes, by 15 minutes. Okay, well, sorry about that. Um, 
So, and the other thing is we see a lot of kids in iPad labs, like in my daughter's school, all the kids go to the iPad lab and they sit there with headphones on staring at an iPad. But you can't learn if you're not interacting with other people. So here's an example. This is a school that we work with in Cambodia. And um, all, I, all I did was we had the iPad and we told them about a game. We showed them a game. And then I just handed out the iPad. And instead of one iPad per child, I said one iPad per, well, one iPad for five kids. And I didn't tell them what to do. And then I let them interact. So this group over here, the one on the left, they all worked on the, on the game together. This group started a competition, three verse three, and they were all playing and they started interacting and they were speaking English to each other because they were let to interact. And this group did it a little bit differently. They did it like um, just all working together. So what I wanted to show you was you can let technology allow interaction to happen just by changing the way. In class in, you have these great breakout rooms. So you can let kids work together on these breakout rooms and they can, they can start interacting with each other without the teacher. So they allow for peer learning. They allow you to develop social skills and language skills and turn taking. The teachers can monitor this as well. And I think what the most exciting thing is you can use this after class. Imagine finishing your class and letting kids speak to each other. So I want to finish with two things really quickly. I want you to have a challenge. Imagine, so remember I, when I talked about my future, I didn't think it could happen. Well, this is what I want to see in the future. Here is a child in Vietnam. At the moment, he's only speaking English to other Vietnamese kids or maybe his teacher. But now we have the technology to allow kids to speak to anyone around the world. So we could have him speaking to my daughter, that's my daughter in China. He could be using something like class in to talk to my daughter in a group class, for example, or after class. He could be talking to people in Germany. They could be talking to each other. Or you could have kids from all around the world talking English to each other. Because right now we're teaching our kids to speak English, but they only speak to each other. And when I organized this talk today, I had to speak to Harry, I had to speak to people in Beijing, people in Vietnam, people in Taiwan, and we used all of this technology so we could work together to put this on today. And I would love to see a future where kids can be working together from different countries using English um, to get to a, you know, an outcome or a task. So the first question I asked was, will this technology lead to better learning opportunities? So I made you all a rubric. You can, I'll, I will send this to all of you. I mean, Harry will send it. And basically it has these things. You just have to tick, does it do the five pillars of learning? But also, is it easy to implement? That's what one person said. It has to be easy to implement. And if the ed tech developers are making it too hard, you should tell them, I don't want your technology until it's easy to implement. Is it curriculum aligned? Some schools get obsessed. Is this exactly the same as my curriculum? Well, guess what? It probably won't be, but it doesn't matter. It's not the most important thing. The curriculum is important, but it's, if you have all the curriculum alignment and no one is learning, then it's not very useful. So focus on the learning first. Is it easy to implement? And is it curriculum aligned? And then lastly, is it affordable? Can our for a school afford it? So you might have something like this, right? You might, sorry, you might end up with something like this. And then you can make a decision about, is this really worth getting? So at the beginning of the talk, you guys said, the most important thing is, is it, is it, can, do I have the hardware to use? But I think for me, the most important thing is, is it really focusing on learning? And is it easy to use? So in summary, focus on the pillars of learning, think about the learning technology and how do they combine these for learning outcomes. Are there any questions? I don't think we'll have time for questions. I'm very sorry, Harry. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. It's totally fine for that. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. I think we asked a lot of questions anyway. 
One more. Oh, sorry. One more. Oh, you go first, Harry, and then I've got one more thing before the end. Yeah. Oh, Harry. So if anyone wants, just um, as a gift from me to you, if you want one year free on our apps, you scan this QR code or take a photo. You can fill in a very short survey and you can have one year free access to one of our apps. If you scan it or take a photo and save it for later. And then lastly, just a very big thank you to class in. And if anyone wants to scan that, they can. Does anyone want to scan it or no? Yeah, they're scanning now. They're scanning now. Yeah. OK, I'll leave that for a second. Thanks. And of course, I want to say a very big thank you to Harry, Viet Tessel, and Class In. And Harry, will you send this out to everybody, this presentation? Yeah. Um, so uh, some, some, some audience asked whether they okay. can have uh, a copy version of your presentation so can, they can study. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So Harry, should I send that to you and you can send to everybody? All right, all right, thanks. Uh, em, em sẽ xin cái bản uh, copy của cái presentation này rồi giúp đỡ cho mọi người đăng cái buổi ngày hôm nay ha. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we, do you have any question for for Jay? Because I think we may have like one or two minutes left. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I wanted to leave 10 minutes, but please go for it. Jake, so much for a wonderful session on technology and also um, teaching. Um, I am a big believer of technology to foster um, English language education and uh, provide the wider access to English language education in Vietnam. And there's a great dis uh, discrepancy between the people in um, big cities and also in rural areas uh, with regard yeah. to opportunities for language learning. However, after the COVID-19, there is a big challenge. And one of the immediate cha uh, big challenge for us is to persuade our parents to use technology or to, uh, to use online classroom uh, for their uh, learning, for their children learning. They reluctant to do that again after the COVID-19. Yeah. So um, as yeah. the educator and also um, educational authorities, what could be some very practical way to persuade parents um, to believe in the um, e effectiveness of uh, um, using technology in language learning, uh, as uh, you mentioned, wonderful ideas. Um, so please share with Yeah, I think it's a great question. Recommendation. Thank you. To me, it's this simple. It, it, the answer is very, very simple. Do not... I think everybody is afraid of technology because in COVID, our kids spent, in my daughter too, you know, six hours every day staring at the screen, right? So what we want to make sure that the parents realize this, we don't want them to stare at the screen all the time. We want to make sure that it's just integrated. Maybe they only need to do 10 minutes or 20 minutes in the day, right? That's all they need to do. So that's why I'm a big fan of, and sorry to talk about study cat, Harry, but I think language learning apps mean you can say to the kid, look, to the parents, we just want them to spend 10 or 15 minutes a day because we know that the learning outcome is going to be better because they are interacting, they are giving feedback. Like, I think the other thing is you want to show them the results of the learning. So something like StudyCat, you can actually see the result of the learning. So you can say to the parents, look, your child is getting better. And I always tell the parents now, just 10 minutes a day is better, like one to one, 10 minutes a day with one smartphone is much better than a classroom of 25 kids and you don't even hear what the teacher is saying sometimes. So yeah, I don't have the exact advice, but I think if you can just encourage them that 10 minutes or 15 minutes a day is good, and then also show them that their kids are actually learning something, yeah. I think the parents then will want to do it more. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Anything else, guys? Thank you for, for okay. your answer, Trey. Um, so I think we can, 
yeah, if we can, can drop off the session here uh, because another speaker is okay. waiting for us. Uh, but by the way, thank you so much. Yeah, sorry about that. You have really excited uh, sharing and 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 yeah, we we'll catch up with you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye from Shanghai, everybody. Thank